Good morning. I have got us focused on that moon setting because it is just amazing and beautiful. And no matter how hard I try, it still looks like a marble to me. But I think I got us a good spot where we can at least see some color and it going down. Thank you for being with me this morning. I'm going to continue on page 118. Detachment from results. Because the gathering of energies we have just described takes place in the heat of competition, in the midst of all the ups and downs that come with winning and losing, the sport participant often acquires a certain detachment from results. If an athlete cannot bear to lose or gets overinflated from winning, he or she is less likely to succeed. So games and contests teach a centeredness in action, a grace under pressure. Such inner poise and disinterest are fundamental to every spiritual teaching. For without them, the richness of awareness is impeded. Detachment from the results of one's actions facilitates a quieting of the mind that makes way for the kinds of experience we examined in the preceding chapters. If the mind is agitated and the emotions in turmoil, there is no room for the extraordinary peace, the sense of power, and the joy that so many sports participants report. The concentration of energies and awareness demanded by sport is heightened, we believe, because it takes place in the midst of winning and losing, in the midst of dramatic ups and downs, the participant who, who perseveres in a sport has to learn the poignant lesson, at some level at least, that there is an interior grace that transcends the world's uncertain results. Sport is likely to instruct us in the ancient wisdom that by losing our lives we gain them. The famous spiritual teacher writes, You may take this for the truth, that when a free mind is really disinterested, God is compelled to come into it. All right, and the next little section is sports, creative, and integrative power. Whether you're learning to run the mile, lower your golf score, or scale a mountain. Sport demands a creative joining of skills and capacities. Willpower, awareness, imagination, emotion, the senses, the intellect, the motor control must all be harmonized for top performance. Dreams and reveries come into play too. New alignments of body and mind seem to take place in the middle of the night, and the process becomes continuous through waking and sleeping. Successful athletes make an enormous number of psychological and physiological connections that lie beyond the scope of verbal awareness. Their creativity is very close to creativity in art science, and religion in this regard. For example, Olympic hurdle champion David Hemery writes, In the course of any season, the athlete will face all of the following defeat and victory, sickness and health, tension and relaxation, degrees of pain, doubt, disappointment and despair, as well as satisfaction and even ecstasy. In his book, 
another hurdle. He describes the way his sport obsessed him day and night through winning and losing, pain and health. He found himself perfecting his ability at home as well as on the track, in his dreams, and in his training sessions. Lee Evans, the 400 meter Olympic champion and world record holder, has talked to us about the power of the subconscious mind to search out flaws in racing style and correct them. Working with Bud Winter, the great sprint coach at San Jose State College in the late 1960s, Evans used self-hypnosis and mental practice for several years while on his way to championships and world records. In practicing for the 1968 Olympics, he visualized every step of the 400 meter race until he saw each stride he would take. By repeating this exercise again and again, he says, his style and pacing got better and the overall flow of his performance was perfected. The world record he set in that race still stands 10 years later. In conversations with me, Murphy, he has talked about the dreams and waking reveries in which new images, ideas, and feelings about his running would appear, sometimes unexpectedly. saying good morning. As I listened to Evans describe this process, I couldn't help thinking about descriptions that certain artists and scientists have given of their discoveries. The French mathematician Henri Poincaré, for example, discovered part of the fusion functions as he stepped onto a bus in the time it took his foot to pass from the ground to the first step, a whole field of mathematics appeared before him. Kekel discovered the formula for the benzene molecule in a dream. Coolridge wrote Kubla Khan after hearing it in a sleep that was stimulated by the opiate laudanum. The history of artistic and scientific discovery is filled with sudden insights of this kind, delivered like lightning from unconscious levels of the mind. The world of sport is filled with similar stories because like art and science, it can engage the imagination and the will down to their deepest roots. For David Hemery, Lee Evans, and other athletes. This all-involving process is part of sports fascination. But psychological integration is more than intrapersonal, for it always involves others. Even in the most individualistic sport like running or mountaineering, friendship and teamwork are involved. Without them, sport loses part of its beauty. Just as it is fundamental to all religious life, cooperation with others has been one of the most honored of sporting virtues. Football player Bill Curry told George Plimpton, and then here's what Bill Curry told George Plimpton, I always knew that if I quit, my relationship with those friends would be different. Okay, let me try that again. I always knew that if I quit, my relationship with those friends would be different. Football is a very exclusive fraternity. Every retired player I've talked to, without exception, has said, when I asked if he missed it, no. 
I don't miss it at all. Who wants to go out there and sweat? Then they get a funny look on their face and they say, but I tell you what I miss. I miss the guys. All right, the next little category, sports exploration of human limits. I'm in an awesome spot. There's the sunrise and my window on the other side and the moon set over here, so. Whew. Good day for Crystal. Okay, sports exploration of human limits. Sport proliferates, one can argue, out of a drive in the human race to realize more and more of its bodily possibilities. One of our most fundamental drives is to know and dramatize the richness of physical life. Some people run, jump, swim, and fly, surf on 20-foot waves, dive to the ocean depths, glide on wings grown smaller and smaller, or climb into dangerous caves or up the most precipitous mountains. Where will this proliferation of athletics end? To what adventures and extremes will it lead us? In this sport, da -da -da -da. in this, sport is like spiritual adventure the world over. When you read the Indian and Tibetan scriptures, for example, you find an immense variety of ways for self exceeding. Thousands, <clears throat> excuse me, thousands of mental states, endless varieties of love and countless supernormal powers are dramatized in the lives of the saints. Both sport and the spiritual life grow out of our human urge to express the richness of existence. The demands our games make on us take many forms, for each has its own particular set of archetypes or ideals Mountaineering and race car driving, for example, require very different sets of capacities. Each stretches us in a special way and aligns us with particular dimensions of experience. And in no other field of human activity is there such a proliferation of specialized physiques. For as athletics have developed in the modern world, they have required an ever greater variety of skills and body structure to support them. Whether it is the muscular frame of a 270 pound defensive tackle, the elastic joints of a gymnast, the progenous, yeah, progen, progenous cardiopulmonary system, the prodigious cardiopulmonary system of a marathon runner or the steady hand of an archer. Never before have there been so many experiments with the body's limits. The vast cultivation and redesign of the body, if we may call it that, provides an unprecedented laboratory for exploring the limits of human possibility. In this, we think sport points beyond itself, for it is possible to imagine an historic adventure in human transformation that might arise in part from the experiments and achievements of athletics. We will say more about this possibility in our concluding chapter. All right, here we go. The next um, little section on page 121 as we roll into 122. Um, sports ability to command long-term commitment. The long-term involvement that sport commands from so many people 
provides a unique basis for spiritual adventure because without sustained commitment, the intricate, far-reaching changes of mind and physique that such an enterprise requires are simply impossible. <clears throat> In most religious teachings, it is said that no lasting realization can be achieved <clears throat> excuse me, without many years of steady practice. Most teachers have said that enlightenment costs no less than everything. Many athletes make that kind of commitment to their sport, at least for a part of their lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. section. The spiritually evocative elements we have discussed, long-term commitment, sustained concentration, creativity, self-integration, being in sacred times and places, and stretching to the limits of one's capacity are common to both sports and religious disciples. Discipline sport and religious discipline. These similarities between the two kinds of activity often lead to the same kinds of experience. In the pages that follow, we will explore the similarities between spiritual and athletic experience more closely. been reading to you. I'm going to stop now because the next one is perennial. perennial. I know that perennial is the wrong word. <laughs> so, perennial. Maybe I'll look it up. How about that? I'll just look it up. That way I can stop saying funny words for no good reason. Um, <clears throat> but the philosophy. Okay. <sighs> And then the provisional reality of the ordinary world, the need for discipline, knowing and expressing the deeper perfection, and the essential ecstasy, knowledge by identity. We're getting there. And like I said, this book only has six chapters, so we're over halfway through five. I hope you've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying reading it to you. Here's our book again. Anybody who wants to get ahead, read ahead, or be ahead, I guess. Thank you for being with me. I appreciate you. <laughs>